Welcome to The Laws of Style, featuring conversations on creativity, fashion, and the law from the leading edge of our economy and culture. Hosted by noted fashion lawyer, Douglas Hand. Hello, and welcome to The Laws of Style. I'm your host, Douglas Hand, and today I'm joined by the VP of Partnerships at Recurate, Karen Dilley. Karen, thank you for joining us here today. You're welcome. I'm so excited to be here. Well, so you left the real, real uh, mm -hmm. less than a year ago to join Recurate, and Recurate provides brands with a platform uh, to do honestly some of what the real, real is doing, but with their own brands. Uh, tell us about it. Yeah. So I can start kind of in my journey of finding and now growing Recurate. So I worked at the Real Real for four years, oversaw a couple of different teams focused on the supply side of things. And I think something we probably don't talk about enough is that um, supply is really the barrier to growing the resale marketplace, getting people to sell. Um, so that was really our team's focus. And one of the teams that I worked with was a team that worked specifically on brand partnerships. So they worked with brands on how to sell, how they were selling items with the real world. But a lot of brands came to us, you know, they wanted information. They wanted to know who are these customers buying secondhand? What are they buying? How long do they have their item for? Kind of all these questions around customer behavior since they saw that customers were really driving the secondary marketplace. And so at the time we worked with them as much as we could, but when I met Adam and Wilson and they explained to me, Recurate was able to provide that information back to brands. I was like, wait a second, this is exactly what brands need. Even if they don't know they quite need it yet, it is what they need. So I was really, really excited when I heard what they were building, particularly because it was underpinned by technology. And it is like my deeply held belief after having almost an entire career in resale that what will scale resale to the point where it needs to be is technology and really not anything else. Well, so I have seen figures about the, the second, the secondary, secondhand, uh, gently loved market for uh, fashion items, which I would consider to be apparel and accessories and footwear mainly, um, in the trillions of dollars. Is, how accurate is that? Can you put a precise figure on it? And uh, why is it so high? That's great. I think it's, um, I think that's an underestimated number. Um, and maybe that's a controversial take, but I just look and see how much is in my closet, how much is in my friend's closet and all these people I know that isn't out there in circularity. And I truly think that means that these numbers are underestimating what is possible. And so when I heard about Recurate and what they were doing, I see it as really like a complementary service um, to what currently is happening with the resale marketplace. So what you think a lot about is the real reels, the Poshmarks, the thread ups, all these different third party sites is what I would call them where people can sell. What Recurate does is tap into that brand experience. So a lot of customers are brand loyalists. They want to engage with the brand. Their values align with the brand. They like the product. I mean, maybe it's as simple as like, it's a good fit for me, you know, like I like the way that they cut their clothes. Um, and so people really want to engage with the brand. So what Recurate does is allow brands to own, um, build the technology so that they can own the resale marketplace. Um, and that to me taps into even more pro like pieces that are out there to be resold. So I don't have an exact number for you. Um, you know, I think we could probably hire consultants and pay them a lot of money to try to <laughs> figure out a number. Well, I um, do know, you know, that the the broadly considered fashion market annually is two trillion dollars, which includes typically perfume, which yeah. is adjacent, but I don't think uh, you know app for resale. Yeah. Um, yeah. once opened sort of tainted, I guess, in, in, in some people's minds, but, um, but maybe just, just back to what you said, there's so much there that I think is rich. I mean, one of the other advantages that say the real, real or other resellers don't have, um, that, that Recurate has is you are really partnering up with the brands and they're owning it. So you take a situation where particularly a long-term legacy brand, a Dior, or you know any of the LVMH brands, um, 
they are generally reluctant. And I think, you know, in the context of the real real, uh, among others, you know, even can fight on certain trademark grounds, uh, the resale market. Um, did you see that at the real real? And, you know, is, is it refreshing to be in the recurate uh, world where you're viewed as a partner? Yeah, it is definitely refreshing to be viewed as a partner. I think you took the words out of my mouth for that one. Um, the way I see it is that brands that don't engage in resale will be left behind. If we're looking 10, 15 years from now, brands are going to have a mix that comes from new product and a mix that comes from secondhand product. They're going to sell it in their stores. They're going to sell it online. It's going to be a part of who brands are and how they merchandise to their customers. So any brand that's not thinking about this, that's not watching the technology, that's not engaging in some capacity, they're going to be left behind. Um, I think what a lot of brands are doing are not publicly coming out about it. Um, so I would guess that some of these luxury brands are really watching to see how the technology, how connected products grow, what that looks like for them and how they can integrate it into what they're doing. So let's get into the technology side a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I take it that Recurate uses NFTs and some forms of AI to, um, you know, to track products, but how much can you tell us about it? And, you know, treat us like we're, we're third graders and, you know, that, that those acronyms that I threw out, some people that are listeners may not even know. Yeah. Yeah. So the best way I can describe it is I actually started my career at Sotheby's. Um, so I started in this resale marketplace and, um, you know, I, I, joke and it's not really a joke that big auction houses were the original sustainability you know they had pieces that changed hands quite frequently and were built to last for a long time um so the way i can explain it is kind of in the context of what you would think of if someone was selling a van gogh um so a van gogh basically um people when people buy it and sell it they either stick stickers or write on the back of paintings um who owned it and in the art world we called that provenance and in fashion world there's historically been no way to track provenance because the way we think about items, um, we kind of think of all the same items together. So everything has one singular skew, but there could be 10,000 of those same items. And what we're now evolving to do with the help of technology is figure out how do we put those little stamps in the same way they put stamps on the back of a painting to see who owned it. How do we put that digitally for clothing, for handbags, for shoes, for all of these items? What what I think is really interesting is you can also go beyond just saying who owned it. You can have essentially a ledger of who owned it, where it was made, what the product was. You can also help a lot with um, you know, other end of life options. So how to recycle the item, where you can upcycle it, all those kinds of things. And essentially all of that is using blockchain to track the items and be able to have this wealth of information in one place. Do you, this is a, a very left field question and it's brought into my mind from from baseball and baseball uh, paraphernalia in, in some ways, but do you think that there is any possibility of collectability of some of these items in particular, I think, you know, of certain Birkin bags or uh, special drops of, of certain sneakers that have happened where they, they almost get acquired and never unwrapped. Um, do you see a market in that? And, you know, obviously your technology would be very useful in that regard. Yeah, I see a, a mass, I mean, that stuff is so cool to me. The idea that scarcity can increase price on the secondary market. So people try to buy it during the drop, they don't get it, then they're willing to pay more on the secondary market for it. We're seeing that more and more. I think a lot of people, um, I kind of think a lot about like Birkins or very rare covetable bags and jewelry in this space. Um, but I also see it as like, you know, we're working with a more rare, a brand, a sustainable brand. They do small batch production. So some of their items, a lot of their items sell out, you know, before the season is over. So they're using their secondary marketplace for customers that maybe missed it the first time around or loved it, loved the cut and the shape and want it in a different color. So it doesn't have to be a $50,000 bag in order to have that covetability. It can be a $150 dress too. Got it. I guess, you know, to, to an extent, the collectible element is at odds with the sustainability 
implications of the technology. I mean, I think of those sneaker heads that have walls and walls of unopened sneakers. And obviously that's just wasteful, but by the same token, those sneakers aren't winding up in landfills. Um, with the more pedestrian fashion items, uh, let us say a nice, but ultimately, you know, basic knit t-shirt. Does the, the cost of doing all of this present any impediment to doing it with those basic items? Yes. So quickly on the sneakerheads, um, I haven't met all of them. There are a lot of them, um, but I've met a few and they actually change out that wall quite a bit. So there are buyers and sellers. I think they, um, from what I hear, think of it as um, almost like the stock market where they collect items based on what they think the resale value will be. As they see a resale value going up for a particular item, they sell off that item, use that to buy a new sneaker. Um, so I actually think it's in line with this idea of circularity. Um, they're also very limited drops and hence that drives the secondary market price up. Um, so they're not overproducing, which as you know, is really a lot of the big issue here is overproduction. Um, so I will take sneaker heads with a wall of sneakers over 15,000 red t-shirts that no one wants, you know? Um, so I just wanted to note that quickly because I think that there's some interesting behavior there that's also going to translate to more of the mass market. So questions about um, items that probably people don't think have a huge resale marketplace. So your example is like a white cotton t-shirt. Um, I think there are great brands that are working really hard on this in different options for end of life. So recycling, upcycling, things like that. I think you had four days on here. They're amazing. They're doing that kind of like productivity, thinking about circularity holistically. Um, I also will say though, it pleasantly surprises me how much is possible to resell. You know, a lot of people for a very long time were like, oh, resale is only for really nice, really high value, high quality things. That's what people want to buy secondhand. But I think a lot of these peer-to-peer -peer sites have kind of blown the lid off of that. I mean, if you look at the average price of Poshmark and Depop, oftentimes it's around $20 that these items are selling for. So they're giving a second, third, and fourth life to items that historically would just have been thrown away. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I sit on the board of Goodwill, um, which along with Salvation Army and others, if you go back to 70s and 80s, I mean, that was what everybody considered resale that and, and a garage sale or a swap meet. Um, this is obviously a, a very elevated form of that. And I will tell you, you know, from experience, you know, Goodwill's retail really just fuels a mission of, of helping people find employment. Um, our, the, the sustainability element is just a separate mitzvah, really, <laughs> for the organization. Right. Um, and so, not surprisingly, we and others haven't done it particularly well. Um, and certainly, it's challenging to do it um, in, in the most uh, efficient commerce, which is e-commerce. Mm -hmm. um, so, on some of the partnerships that you have, or the clients that you have, depending upon how you view them. I mean, if you're at liberty to name some of them, please do so. And, um, you know, give me kind of a low high. Where do you, you know, what, what, what is the most mass brand that you represent? And then what is maybe the most luxury and exclusive? Yes. So what I think is great about peer-to-peer -peer resale, especially integrated directly with the brand, it can be across all kinds of different price points. So we work with a brand Womance in Canada, you know, their resale is around, or their retail is around $50. Uh, we also work with like Mara Hoffman and Laleen and Rachel Comey that their dresses can sell for $750, $850 brand new. Um, so there's kind of this whole spectrum of people who want to engage in resale. And to your point of of, you know, Goodwill not necessarily doing resale all that well. When we created this technology and we built it for brands, a huge aspect of what we wanted to build was making it really easy for sellers. So we wanted them to really feel like it was easy to sell their items. Because, you know, throwing everything into a Goodwill, Goodwill bag and chucking it into a truck as they pass by is like the easiest way to get rid of things. But it's also maybe not the most sustainable way to do resale. So we wanted to make it really easy. So we made it so if you were to go on to Lawleen or Mara Hoffman or Rachel Comey, 
you can go into your order history. You literally click a button that says resell, and then it populates all the information about the piece, the original um, brand images, the original description, the original price, everything that you would regularly have to like hunt for and figure out and like screenshot on your phone to try to list it. All of that is pre-populated for you. Essentially all you need to do as a seller is to put the condition of what the item is in now, since that's really the only thing that should have changed. And with digital ID, what we can do is you'll be able to take your phone, scan a QR code, and that page will come up directly from that QR code. So really making it as easy as possible. Then it goes up on the brand's website. The brand approves it. So they know everything that's going up on their site. And then it's open to all these customers that want that brand. You know, the vast majority of people who shop secondhand are shopping by brand. You know, they're going, when they go to these big third-party marketplaces, they're putting in the brand that they want. Right. So customers are already doing this and now they can do it directly through the site. Um, so we see this as like a massive way to tap into loyalty too. It's customers who want to be a part of this ecosystem, who want to engage with this brand. Maybe the price point is too high for them. Maybe they just are shopping by their values. We see this a lot with millennials and Gen Z. You know, I have friends that haven't bought a new thing in a couple years now, which I think is super impressive. Um, and, and they really, they live by this. So to them, if a brand has the option to buy secondhand, they're going to buy there. Yeah. Well, it brings up it's going to not be a question in some senses after what you've said, but but it may get us talking a little bit more along these lines. I mean, the knock on eco sustainable brands um, has often been that is simply a luxury I can't afford because I go into and I'll I'll use Stella McCartney. You know, I go into a Stella McCartney store and the price points are just beyond my means, mm -hmm. and so sustainability and fashion is inherently elitist. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a brand being able to authenticate and offer secondhand goods is creating a path to a lower price point. Um, how do they typically sell it? Is it a set price point for those goods or is it a bidding system or can it be both? Yeah, so I'll say from a personal note, um, I deeply value accessibility and accessibility to high quality products, I think is so important. And a lot of our brands see this as a way for them to open up to different price points. You know, people who want to engage with their brand, who want high quality products. This I think is particularly true and a little maybe out of the realm of your usual talking points, but it's particularly true in like the outdoor space, outdoor gear, which has been, you know, predominantly a white, a wealthy space because it is so financially cumbersome to get gear and to get out in places. And so what we really see is secondhand gives this amazing opportunity for people who aren't quite sure if they want to buy a thousand dollars worth of gear for one trip to see if they like it or not, they can buy it at a much lower price point. So I see accessibility as a massive advantage to resale and a component of sustainability or circularity that really opens it up to the masses. Well, and that's encouraging, right? Because we look at the current fashion system uh, and the for-profit motive and the public company motive, right? <laughs> and it has been since inception designed to induce obsolescence in what you just bought because to increase growth, you got to yeah. buy something new in three months. Right. right. Um, how do you find the balance here though? Yeah. For a brand that say traditionally has built on that model and most brands have been built yeah. on that model to, um, to pivot to this model and still see the same revenues and and here's the key for the stock market growth right right i mean this is um this is the crux of most sustainability initiatives at big brands and a lot of them are like ooh, it costs a lot of money and it doesn't drive growth or maybe it drives some growth through through press and marketing and things like that so when we create when our founders created your Re recurate and the way that we think about um, how we scale this business is that we want to take items that have been made because truly the most sustainable item is one that already exists and how do we generate revenue each time you sell that item so for a brand 
rather than just thinking, oh, I can, I generate revenue from selling it once you can generate revenue from selling it multiple times. And that means you're growing without creating. Um, so I think that is the mindset that a lot of our brands are getting into. And we call it the circular lifetime value rather than a customer lifetime value. It's this idea that for a long time, we think of customer value as linear, get them to buy more and more frequently. And so how do you make that into circularity? How do you get them to buy a new item and then sell it? They earn site credit, then they come back, maybe buy another new item and then sell that. At the same time, you're driving growth because you're tapping into this new customer base of customers who are excited about buying retail. You're pulling them into a an engagement and into a brand conversation around what is possible for them at the brand, what they could buy. Um, it's really creating that relationship between customers and brands and that loyalty. So that's where we see a lot of this growth come from. Well, what's interesting, I often think that one of the models for this, ironically, it, the automobile industry, in fact, yeah. gasoline cars, obviously, are, are, not, uh, are not great for the planet. Um, but the industry in terms of offering renewed life and you know pre-owned vehicles and keeping parts and having a supply chain that when a car is more than generally loved and, and, and even goes into a junkyard, any salvageable parts are ultimately saved to be used on other cars. We've never thought of apparel that way or even yeah. accessories, um, but is there also that type of a market for um, more accessories and perhaps shoes, but you know, could they be salvaged for parts? Yeah, we think about it a lot. Um, in this, I'm, I, I love all your questions. They're so good because there's nuance in this space. Yes, um, you know, it's not just there's not a single bullet for for circularity, and I think that that's sometimes hard for people to understand. Um, we think a lot about resale in the capacity that it can inform a lot of decisions. So we talked so far a lot about customer decisions, customer acquisition, loyalty, those kinds of things. But there's also this whole really interesting space around data that you get from products being resold. So customers put in the condition of items because it's tied directly to the original item. We can pull all this interesting data. How long on average do customers keep their item for? What were the like the fault points essentially and in, in in something happening to that item? What was the resale price, which can dictate a lot on what people really cherished and what they wanted to hold on to or held a lot of value to. So there's a lot of interesting data that you can start pulling when you start owning this resale. And what we're doing is feeding that data back to our brand partners. And we call it a partnership because we want to be partners in giving them this data so that they can act on it so that then they can start making their products better and making smarter products. Again, back to the like 15,000 red shirts. If those aren't selling, if they're not showing up on the resale market, if people are you know, not wanting those, they can have that data and be able to make better production decisions down the road. Yeah. Well, so maybe not surprisingly, Recurate is backed by Google's AI-focused venture fund. Um, is it Google technology that drives a lot of the, the, the back end? Yeah, we partner really closely with Gradient. Um, we integrate, uh, you know, with a lot of different technology, not exactly with Google yet, um, but we think it's important to be able to be the connectivity, essentially, that kind of brings this whole resale space together. Um, I am so bullish on technology being the way that we scale. Um, you know, I kind of joke, if you look at my career path, I keep going down in value of items. So <laughs> went from like million dollar paintings at Sotheby's to like Birkin bags at the real real. And now we're like reselling, you know, a hundred dollar shoes. Um, but really what that's, has to me, that's encouraging though, you <laughs> yes, know, because, yes. because we need to see the resale model go down exactly. all the way to the basic fungible good. Exactly, exactly. And that's how I feel about it too, is that technology has helped democratize this. And so particularly with peer-to-peer, -peer, we see the ability there. If you think about it, there's kind of two different ways to resale. I would call them like a managed marketplace and then peer-to-peer. -peer. A managed marketplace, 
you ship an item to a warehouse, someone there authenticates photographs, um, you know, writes the copy, stores the item, and then it's shipped again. From just a resources perspective, both time and, you know, the kind of impact on the planet, it's a high cost, essentially. And you really see that value degradation in those items. So we've seen it work well for higher price items, um, for things that have large margins, essentially. But the mass majority of things out there to be resold, especially in apparel, fit much better with peer-to-peer -peer because it goes directly from a seller to a buyer. And that's really where we focus a lot of our technology because it can scale so much faster. You don't have to basically create a warehouse. You don't have to create all these systems. You can really start as soon as you can load it onto your e-com site. Got it. Well, look, with all of these positives, um, for the planet. Uh, I don't know if Recurate is currently a, a B Corp certified company. Uh, if not, do you know if they've considered it or are talking about it? Yeah, we are not right now. Um, I love the idea of B Corp. I love what they're doing. I think it's so deeply important. Um, but I will say that it is a it's a it's a process as it should be. You know, there should be a high standard for these approval processes. Um, so we have thought about it. We're working on it. We're just not quite there yet. Yeah, pivoting quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, coming off the pandemic, more and more people are returning to work, but in limited numbers and in limited capacities. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you think that the 18 months to two years of people working from home uh, has impacted professional dress? And do you think it's to the benefit of the secondary market? That's a great question. Um, so we have, I, yes, the answer is yes. Clothing has changed in the past couple of years. Um, I actually live in Brooklyn and I feel like everyone's dressing so much more casual, but yet in a lot of ways more chic too, um, because it's this idea of like, when we do get outside and when we are walking around, this is our time to like shine and peacock a little bit, you know? Um, so what historically kind of been wearing just your sweats to go to the grocery store is like your time to go out to the grocery store and show the outfit you wore for the day. Um, so I kind of love that because I think it means people are, their style is evolving. They're being a little bit more true to themselves and what they're wearing. Um, and then when they do go to events to, you know, dinners and things like that can really show off what they're excited about. Um, and, and I mean, this won't surprise anyone. I think tops and t-shirts are doing a lot better than pants right now. Um, so there is that. But how that changed or affected the secondary market, I think there was a big boom in people cleaning out their closets when we all first went into lockdown. I think no surprise to anybody. But what has pleasantly surprised me is that People keep doing it. You know, they realize that they didn't need to live with a massive closet. They didn't need a ton of pieces. And what I love is when people sell kind of in order to buy something else. So maybe they see a dress that they're super excited about. They want it for that season. They go into their closet. They find the dress, the Lolene dress maybe. And they're like, oh, I haven't worn this in a couple of years. Let me sell that, get the site credit, and then buy the new dress that I want. So it's almost like a swap out rather than like keep constantly expanding your closet. Yeah. Um, and we've seen I've that heard a lot of that one in one out sort of yes. rule these mm -hmm. days, which is New Yorkers. I mean, we, we get it. I think, you know, some people in other regions may have vaster closets, but that doesn't that doesn't alleviate the general anxiety when you, you are actually faced with too many choices. That is a, is a problem. I mean, if you look right now, like we definitely have this idea I think in general in our society that you can't rewear things or you can't double up on things. Um, and as I started, especially working at the real real and understanding truly how high quality, particularly luxury or affordable luxury could be, I was like, oh, I want to start investing some pieces. I won't have those pieces forever, but I'll have them for a few years. And I want them to be able to last those few years. And then I'll go and resell them. And I think a lot of consumers, especially millennials um, are thinking that way a bit more and more. And I think the, the pandemic and COVID made people really start thinking about how they spend their time, what they spend their time doing, what they buy, what they include in their home, and all of that is related. 
Well, and so what is your personal closet situation? Are you a one in one out uh, out there in Brooklyn or, you know, do you have a, a broader view? So a mix. Um, I, you know, I have pieces that I've inherited um, from my mom, from my grandmother. Um, I have pieces that I've had for like fast fashion that I've had forever, eight, nine, 10 years that you won't see me getting rid of anytime soon. Um, I bought a lot, maybe too much when I worked at the real, real um, and really built out this wardrobe that I felt really strong about that I like liked the pieces that they were timeless pieces. Um, and then I also swap things out. So I buy things that I think I buy them resale um, that I think are interesting, fun colors, for example. Um, I'll wear them for as long as they bring me joy and then I'll go and sell those items. Um, I will say my, the first place I look when I go to buy an item is always secondhand. Um, there's just so much out there that I usually can find exactly what I want secondhand. So would you, would you agree that really there are enough clothes on the planet today that we don't need to make any new clothes? You know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think it's a hard question because the, a lot of the clothes that we've made already were not designed to be upcycled or recycled or resold. And so a lot of these clothes won't hold up to the wear and tear of normal life, you know? So with, I think, and where I see change is moving that, moving that percentage. So the way I see it is like moving the percentage of new versus resale. And I think this kind of brings us back to the beginning of our conversation that there's going to be up in five, I think sooner than five years, but we'll say five years where brands will be merchandising secondhand as well as new. And that has a lot of these um, like flywheel effects. It means they'll be making better product new. It means that they'll be able to bring in this new cohort of, of buyers that are excited about this space. So I really think that um, yes and no, like we have a lot of work to do on the products we create in the primary market. And I think the secondary market can inform a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and also without new clothes, where does fashion go? Right. Um, you know, without new design, there's no need for fashion weeks. There's no, and, and I think there is a zeitgeist element to what is current and new coming out of the brains of designers. Um, one might say you could do that with simply upcycling old things, but you then at least are kind of constrained to a certain canvas because it's already there and not the blank slate. So uh, I would agree with you that it is certainly about a balance as someone who loves great design and, and, yeah. and creativity. And creativity. And I think sometimes that that's lost when people think about um, creating new products is like, I say, you know, I love beautifully designed products because people I think were a little surprised when I went from Sotheby's which is more traditionally art into a more fashion space and I was like it's this it's it's beautifully well created well designed items and that is exciting for a lot of people it's like creating new art um and I think that there's still a place for that in a lot of ways well, perhaps on, well, certainly on a more personal note, for you, uh, who are some of your style inspirations, whether they're designers, uh, famous figures, uh, alive or, or dead? Yes. Um, so mostly it's anybody who dresses for themselves. Um, I love that you can tell when you look at someone, if they've dressed for other people or if they're really dressing for themselves. Um, there's a great sound on TikTok, TikTok that I see pretty often. It's like, I don't dress for men. I dress so 13 year olds think I'm cool. And I think that that is such a fantastic way, um, of thinking about it. And maybe it's the, the, so, so my 13 year old self thinks I'm cool or something like that. And, and sometimes when I get dressed in the morning, I'm like, oh, my 13 year old self would think I'm a badass. Um, and so that's like the way I think about it. Um, but on a personal note for me in particular, um, my grandmother was phenomenal. She had a great eye for style. Um, she always added in color. She had amazing earrings. Um, she lived through the Great Depression. So it was really a point of pride for her that she um, owned beautiful clothes and got to 
express herself through that way. Um, I also actually still own, I'm looking at it right now, a chair that she used to sit in and read in. It's probably 70 years old now. The chair I'm sitting in was her dining room table chair. Um, so I think it goes back to that idea that if you make really high quality pieces, they can last a really long time. And she like, I, I just pulled that chair up and I realized she'd recovered it like three times. There's like three different um, sets of fabric on it. So it's cool to me to see that um, these styles, you know, traditional um, furniture is coming back into style. And so it's all cyclical in a lot of ways too, but she was very cool. Um, and I, I got gained a lot of inspiration from her. Um, well, what about contemporary brands that you like from a design perspective or, or a sustainability perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, I love Clara V right now. Um, I love bright, bold colors. So um, if you're listening to the podcast, you can't see it, but I'm wearing a red and pink sweater. Um, and I love this idea of kind of these bold, I mean, she has bold, um, handbags and then bald straps and I got like a really cool sweater from there recently they just got into um they just got into apparel as well so I think really again it goes back to that self-expression and like being yourself and who you are and I think Claire V in a lot of ways does that um now brands uh, like a more Ver, like Outer Known. I mean, I'd have to put a plug in for a lot of our brand partners, Peak Design, basically any brand that has stood up and said, we want to be a leader in circularity and we're going to own our resale, I think is phenomenal. And I want to work with them and buy from them and be a part of what they're doing. Um, because this, I mean, you know, as well as I do, a year ago, we couldn't have had this conversation. It wasn't really happening. It's really been in the past year that brands have stood up and become leaders in this space. Um, so anybody who's building out an ecosystem and engaging with their customers, talking about this in a, in a really great way. I think those are the future. Um, they are the future and I'm buying from them. Well, let's talk also a relatively recent development with social media and the expansion of social media, the, the influencer and the rise of the mm -hmm. influencer economy, particularly in fashion. Um, who are some of the influencers that you think um, are really espousing uh, the secondary market and, and who are some that you think maybe in this next five year period where we see a real expansion of it uh, could become household names? Yeah. So um, I think like all of us, I have a mixed relationship with social media. So I don't know how many influencers I would or could want to name by name, um, but from what I see, and what I do consume, um, I think it's really cool that there are so many ways now for people to get the word out about what they're doing and how they're thinking about things. And I think this goes back to like our conversation about B Corp and certifications and things like that. Um, a lot of people like don't know what to believe. And so influencers have come out and said like, hey, I've done some research or this is some information I have. They're not sponsored by anyone. They're just concerned about it too. A lot of them come with like their depth of knowledge. So you see people coming who worked in this space or know things about this space and they're able, they have a platform essentially to share a lot of that. I think that's a double-edged sword and we probably don't wanna go down that rabbit hole of what is possible uh, when people who say they're experts but actually aren't experts speak on social media. Um, but I love that a lot of these stories can be told in a very different, genuine way um, and really thinking about it. I will also say, I appreciate that people have a platform to keep brands accountable. I think a lot of this change in resale is actually driven by customer behavior. It's not brands being um, in the leadership position. It's customers saying that this is what we want. And then, you know, we as business leaders are building businesses around what the customers are telling us. So social media is a great way for that feedback loop and that way to think about um, essentially what do customers want? What are they telling us they want to want? They want to, us to build, and how can we build that? No, that's a great point, because certainly there are brands who can't just base it on revenues and people voting with their pocketbooks, so to speak, um, but their potential customers, right? Their future customers, those luxury right. brands that really don't know which 20-year-olds are their customers because those 20-year-olds haven't gotten to the point where they can afford the brand. Um, what about collaborations in this um, 
secondary market, I haven't seen a lot of collaborations happen. And maybe that's because it is, it is so intimate, typically to the brand, their secondary market. But do you see there being an opportunity there for collaborations to arise in this secondary market economy? Yeah, I think it's bound to happen. So I think of collaborations a couple of different ways. Um, I think across brands, so brands working together, particularly, um, and you, you've seen this as much as I do, uh, these kind of big houses coming together and owning a bunch of different brands. They have this amazing ability to move the needle because they do have such an economic impact. You know, if if a, a group of brands that each are, you know, a billion dollars, if they make a small incremental change, it's actually a massive change change and what they're doing. Um, and it has a huge impact on what that means globally. So I see a huge opportunity for these groups of brands to really come out as leaders in the space to integrate this directly within the brands, um, which I think is so cool. And then on like the actual resale side, we see a big opportunity to kind of meet customers where they're at, offer different options. You know, I said in five years, I think that retail and resale will be just as omni-channel. So you'll be able to resell your item in store, online, with the brand, with a third-party marketplace. It'll be similar to what retail is now. And I really see that by pulling together a lot of different um, you know, providers, depending on what you want to do. There are uh, companies that are working on upcycling. There are some that work on repairs. And the way where we curate sees ourselves is the technology to really bring that all together. So we can integrate with your repairs team. We can work with you on a take back for upcycling and how you want to list and merchandise those upcycled items. We can integrate with your digital ID so that you can track all these items as you roll that out. Um, so there's a lot of different optionality to kind of really customize the resale marketplace to the brand and what their their customers are excited about. What other industries? I mean, we've talked about the automobile industry. We've alluded to furniture, really, uh, but I think we both know it too is an industry that's seeing some rapid change in terms of the resale market. Um, what other industries are right for this change? So you think outdoor apparel, but also outdoor gear. Um, so there's a whole gear space that's really interesting for us. Um, and that we've started talking to brands about this too, is like, uh, you know, call them gearheads in the same way you call them sneaker hats, but there's people who are so invested in this space to really take care of their pieces and then maybe want to upgrade to a new bike rack or a new, um, you know, bike bag, things like that. And so being able to have that circularity there, I think a lot of them have been doing it kind of on a micro level for a long time, the customers themselves. So how do you really scale that and, and create and democratize using technologies that a lot of people have access? Um, also, anything to do with like baby maternity, I think is, is, is ripe space too. Um, you know, you probably know this, but you know, 15 years ago, you drive around and most consignment stores were baby consignment stores, you know, it was people who bought items and then their kids used them for three months probably, and then they were selling them. So that's a massive space as well. That's really right for a lot of it because of that turnover and that time of life. I also think jewelry is a massive space for it. Um, you know, some of my friends, when I started at the real world, they were like, oh, I couldn't imagine getting like a used engagement diamond. And I was like, do you realize all diamonds are like a billion years old? They're all used. And um, I think that's hard for people to comprehend in some ways because of some great marketing um, tactics. Yeah. Yeah. But it truly is, you know, so we think that there's a lot of spaces that will see this growth and that resale will grow because the customers are demanding it. Well, Karen, I apologize, but we are out of time. Oh, so sad. Um, this was so yeah. fun. Any, any last shout outs, whether to nonprofits that you work with or, or other elements of the business that we didn't touch on? Yeah, I just want to say... Um, you know, we are just so impressed with customers who are engaging with this, who are trying it, who customers, and I don't mean brands, I mean like the people who are posting their items, who are reselling them, who are buying secondhand, who know that this is in future, who think about their impact. I mean, they are the ones driving this. They are the ones we're doing this for. They are the ones that are gonna help us like try to get out of this terrible climate mess as much as possible. And so to them, I'm super appreciative and, and forever in awe. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for your time, listeners. Thank you for tuning in. And we'll see you next time. Thanks Bye so now. much. You've been listening to The Laws of Style with Douglas Hand. 
For more information, go to our website at www.hballp.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at, at Hand of the Law. Thank you for tuning in and stay stylish.